e honere te hikuroere ki te atua he mangarongo ki te whenua he whakaro pae ki ngā tangata katoa ko tainui toko waka ko nga te mani poto me nga te pao toko iwi ko nga te hene keno me te urikaraka toko hapu ko te kete o te rahanga me wharekaua kaiawa toko marae ko mahina rangi Forbes toko ingoa nō reira Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'd like to uh, first of all acknowledge and thank those who organise this hui and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to see so many here today. It's a long shot from when we used to go out and there would be about five that turned up so it must be getting serious. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Fire Bonnie, thank you for the introduction and also our matua um, to, tam te paere uh, o tūhoi. Um, for those here today, it's a pleasure to be here uh, within uh, Te Arawa, tēnā koutou. Um, I really am going to enjoy sharing this kaupapa because we were here not so long ago, um, about three, four weeks ago, and now we're back here again, and um, it's a real pleasure. So, kia ora koutou. I'm going to um, share with you this kaupapa today is about something or things that were actually put in place around about the late 1700s. I'm going to share this kaupapa because it's really important to us as Māori. These are safety mechanisms that our tūpuna put in place a long time ago. They've always been there and they're actually still there for us as Māori to utilise. Um, I'm going to go back to, as I said, the late 1700s, around the time that the whalers, sealers, traders began to come down past our back doorstep, Aotearoa. And uh, if we just look at this map up here, um, all those countries were actually the countries that our tūpuna used to trade with. And around that time, 1700s, um, it's not only important that this corridor has been handed down by our tūpuna, but it's also been very important that the written evidence and documentation has also been sourced. Um, and so the early colonials, the wonderful thing is they wrote everything down. Everything that happened during the day, it was all written down as an entry of what actually happened and passed during that day. So the first um, colonial or missionary who was based here, Samuel Marsden, actually documented that ship repairs or shipbuilding began in the late 1700s and the resources that were very important to them that they saw were our kauri, our kahikatea, our totara that made perfect ship masks for their shipping industry. <laughs> Another resource that was important to them was our harakeke because that made rope for the shipping industry as well. And where we are situated on this map we are right at the very bottom. There was only two waves around the world, right around the top when the ice had melted and around the bottom because there was no Suez Canal, there was no Panama Canal, and there was only right on past our doorstep. So that is why it was very um, important when they did come by, they saw our resources and began to stop off. In 1805, England won the Battle of Trafalgar. And... England being right up the very top of the globe, we wonder how we had anything to do with it being right at the very bottom. But in actual fact, it is documented that our timbers, our native timbers, were used and uh, as ship masts built into the ship masts and because they were tall, straight, they could pull their sails up higher, they outsailed the French and the Italian. From that point on, England became the mistress of the seas. And this whole thing is about trade. This whole relationship that our tūpuna began with uh, other countries around the world was about trade. In 1831, one of our ships was confiscated uh, from the West Indies. At this point, it was the third ship that was confiscated and a group of ariki travelled from Aotearoa up to England and met, met with King George IV because of the relationship that was going on at that time, the Ariki asked King George IV what could be done about the fact that one of his British um, uh, admirals had confiscated our ship 
And so King George IV agreed that he would give the flag. Now, the design of the flag was actually um, designed by Tupuna, and it was one of three designs, but the actual mandate of that flag meant that our ships, when carrying them, would have free access to every British port throughout the world under King Henry VIII's charter. King Henry VIII's charter goes right back to the first herb and spice trade throughout the world. And from that point on, we had access um, to every British port with trade by carrying this flag. The flag that was gifted or chosen was actually a flag very similar to this one up the back, but instead of white around the red St. George Cross, it was actually black. And uh, the, British re the British resident who was based here at the time, Samuel Marsden, was instructed by the Crown of England to have this manufactured in New South Wales. And it was received here at Mahia on the East Coast under a 21-gun salute, meaning it was recognition from one sovereign nation to another sovereign that the inhabitants of New Zealand were their own sovereign nation. The colours that were actually carried on the flag or carried on our ships beforehand were colours from this giant prehistoric eagle called Hokioi. And the colours from this is a red, a dark blue, black, a gold and a white. And these were the colours that were dyed and dyed muka that was attached to this, the uh, ship mast. And this is where the British Admiral didn't recognise what those dyed bits of flax were. And that's why our ship was confiscated. This prehistoric eagle is the largest eagle in the world and it only lived here in Aotearoa. And this is history that I certainly wasn't taught at school, and I know that it wasn't within our New Zealand education curriculum to teach us about the actual history of our tūpuna. I actually knew more about English and European history than I did about our own Māori history. So this, um, this picture here was actually constructed by the National Geographic magazine and the reason that they could get exactly where the colours were is because all that knowledge was preserved in our ancient waiata. The National Geographic was able to prove that they pulled up bones um, with the archaeologists and the wingspan across that they measured was something like 22 feet wingspan across. It was so large that it used to prey on more. When we shared this corridor and took it down to, Wai, uh, to Waipaunamu and shared the same corridor with Waitaha, they were able to take us to the ancient um, sacred spots where they showed us this big craggy rock where this hokiwa used to live. And the measurements that they had on the, on the bones that, that remained within their hapu iwi was that it was 33 foot wingspan across. So this is information that is so important, not so much about the fact that it was way back in prehistoric times, but it actually carried through. Because these colours um, are still used today. All these flags here, and maybe later on you can come up here and have a look and view them, are actually all flags that were in place before 1840. It is acknowledged at international level they still stand today and they still exist. It's just that we've never really been taught about them. In 1864, there was a change to the design of this large flag at the back here, the Māori sovereign flag. And according to the corridor of Kohuiaro, it was that Taranaki wished to have an input into the design. And because they've always been known for their white feather, the black was removed and it was replaced by white. Within the flag itself, there's a breakdown of enzymes. There's an eight-point star, a seven, a six, and a five. And the eight-point star represents Māori sovereignty, protected by Whakapapa. The seven-point star represents Ngā Ariki me Ngā Rangatira. The six-point star represents the native defence. And the five-point star represents Ngā Hapu Katoa, or Kohuiaro. At that same time, there was another shipping company that entered into the waters of Tamuananui Akiwa. 
And this shipping company was called the Union Steamship Company. It was later known as Shaw Savile, and then we know that same line today as the P&O lines. And the colours that were gifted to them in the same respect as King George IV gifted us, a flag to enter every British port throughout the world. The colours that were gifted to the Union Steamship Company to enter the waters of the Moana Nui Akiwa, which is this map here, were the colours of the Hokioi. Red, gold, blue and white. And it's exactly this flag that's here. And if you look on every container on the railway, every truck on the road, every ship at sea, you'll find that the uh, P&O lines still have this flag painted on the side. And in their head office, they still hold the flag of the Māori sovereign nation because that was their right, that was the authority that the uh, Tupuna gave them to enter the waters of the Pacific. This flag here, oh sorry, this map here, which is uh, like three triangles, is known as Whakaahua Te Ao Marama, or the Sacred Mirror Triangle of Te Moana Nui Akiwa. It is mapped from ancient Hawaiian, ancient Tahitian, and ancient Māori dimensions of the heavens. The boundaries within there make up all the countries that are within the boundaries of Te Moana Nui Akiwa. And each point that that triangle um, point is on is actually a reflection of the stars in the heavens. And this, this area here is what uh, the Union Steamship Company was allowed to enter into, carrying the mandate and authority um, from the colours of Hokioi. Now, because there were many, many things that began to take place in the life of our tupuna, Um, it was really important that they all got together. The reason being is that not only was there threat and concern for Aotearoa, there was also a concern for every country within the Pacific or within Te Moana Nui Akiwa. The reason being is that the north was coming down through the south and it was important to begin to protect the whenua, protect the resources um, for, future, for the future generations. And so there was a gathering at a place called Okoroire, which is not far from here. Um, it's where the hot pools are. I think there's a pub and a golf course here at the moment. But it has a very historical background. Sometime during the 1500s, it was when Mahinarangi from Ngāti Kahununu, Ngāti Porau, was coming through to meet with Tūrongo of Tainui and uh, on her way she was hapu and she stopped and she gave birth to Rokawa at Okoroere. And through that, and there's much history and evidence that the United Tribes used to meet at Okoroere. And so in 1808 is where the Araki Rangatira got together and they formed a structure called Te Runanga Kohuiro, meaning the gathering of the hundreds or gathering at large. And it was through this that they saw that there was going to be an exploitation in the, in the future of our whenua and of our resources. This is the first structure of a parliament. And it was set up way back in 1808. It was set up in two parts. It was an upper house and a lower house. The upper house being known as Te Whare Wai Hautapu, and it is totally unpenetratable by government. It is also unpenetratable by any other sovereign around the world. The bottom whare, known as Te Whare e Ruru i o Huhanga, is operated totally by hapu. Without the bottom, the top doesn't work. Without the top, the bottom doesn't work. It has actually just been dormant in recess since 1947. I'd like to just briefly go through these because it's very important that uh, this history here actually covers everything within a nation. 
these boxes, and I know down the back you won't be able to read what, what's actually in them, but I'll just um, read out to you what they are. On this side there is a whare here called Te Moana Nui Akiwa, and it actually represents all the ariki within the countries of this boundary uh, on this map, Te Moana Nui Akiwa. Way before 1840, there was a exchange of contractual treaties within these different nations, and the reasons being they were uniting in order to protect the whenua and resources in the future. So Te Moana Nui Akiwa actually sit in this whare, in this upper house of this kohu, um, kohuiaro. Te Whare Te Karere represents the archives that belong to the Māori nation. And it is really important that we're aware there are three main archives. There is Te Whare Te Karere, there is the House of St. James in England, and there are the archives within Parliament within New Zealand. And I'd like to take our attention to this uh, precious tonga, which is actually a photograph of what they call the Mandate Treaty. It is the only one that holds the seal of Queen Victoria, the seal of Waikato Tairia, who was the Taipuru at the time of 1840, and the seal of Governor Hobson. Governor Hobson's signature and a witness to his signature. Te Whare Te Karere represents the seal of Waikato Tairia. The House of St. James in England represents the seal of Queen Victoria. And the seal of Governor Hobson represents the archives here in Parliament in New Zealand. Now, there have been many fires, there have been many uh, floods, and the archives here in New Zealand have actually had a lot of damage to our history, as well as destroying our, our history, but it is still in its full entirety within Te Whare Te Karere and within the House of St. James in England. Te Whare Taonga represents the whare that houses all the contractual treaties. All those countries there exchange contractual treaties with our sovereign nation. And those contractual treaties still exist today because they were at sovereign level. And so long as there is a descendant of that sovereign line, then that contractual treaty remains. The, in Wellington, up until the 1920s, there was a whare that used to house all these taonga, but because of the uh, downturn and there was no putia left to maintain, then there was no choice for the ariki to pull down that whare, burn it, and bury the remains. But the actual taonga went out to Nahoe Fa to the descendants of the ariki line as kaitiaki until such time as they all come back together again. And in the last four years, that's exactly what's been happening. These tonga have all been coming back to one venue. Te Whare Whakaahua is the house of authorities on behalf of the Māori nation. This mandate treaty would be one of those tonga. There is another important tonga which is called Te Awarangi Nui o Mokoya, and it is the free carriage of Westminster, which allows us as the Māori nation to go direct to the Privy Council by the Crown of England. And the history has always been there, that our tūpuna, our ariki, didn't go through the colonial system that was set up. They jumped on their ship and they went straight to England, from crown to crown. And that's all through history, that they never went through the avenue that was actually set up for non-Māori in this country. There are many other taonga that represent the authorities on behalf of the Māori nation. Te Whare Tairea represents a sovereign line that is protected by Whakapapa and it cannot be changed in any way. Te Whare Native Internal Affairs looked after health, education, housing and welfare. And Te Whare Awaroa was the first bank ever set up here in Aotearoa and it was the Māori Reserve Bank. It was uh, set up in 1808 up in uh, Kōrarareka, up north, but I'll go more into that history when I get to that point. But it may be empty at the moment, <laughs> but I'm sure it, well, it is absolutely protected and still in place for the Māori nation to utilise. It is the Māori Reserve Bank. The Royal Palace Household Guards represents exactly that that we had 
um, the protection to look after the sovereign line. And it's been good that I've been able to bring photographs from the archives because with photographs, you can't deny history. This photograph here represents the Kohuiro Palace Household Guards. If you look at closely later, you'll find that they're made up from all different nationalities because of the contractual treaties we had with the other sovereign nations in protection of each other. The Araki aristocrats, Ahu Piri o Nga Kohere. Aristocrats being a European word, but that's exactly how our Araki are documented in the House of St. James in England. TAS, T-A-S-S, represents Taiopuru Awuroa Secret Service. And as in every sovereign, there has always been an intelligence service to look after the welfare of the sovereign line. TAS was known to be very active during the Second World War. In fact, it is known as one of the best intelligence services in the world. When Kohuiro went into recess, TAS went into recess as well. Now, in this bottom whare, the Native Internal Affairs looked after health, education, papakaing and welfare at the different waka level. The commercial arm looked after trade with all those countries that we had contractual treaties with. The Onehunga Endowment Trust was the name of the lower bank that the Māori Reserve Bank, the Awaroa Bank, had passed the warrant down to. The Onehunga Endowment Trust still exists today, and in fact, when Kohuiro went into recess, it came under the trusteeship of the government. So it still exists today. The Native Justice Department looked after exactly that, that we had Māori <coughs> customary law here in this country before European law. And the Minister of Justice, Doug Graham, has publicly stated, I think about two years ago, there are two laws in this country. There is Māori customary law and there is European law. And the sooner that New Zealand as a whole <coughs> understands this and becomes aware of it, the sooner we can just get on with what we're meant to be getting on with. The Native Defence, as the Six Point Star represents, we had our own native defence before, and it's not about us setting up another defence. We have a very good national army and a very good national um, navy. It's just that this is the history that was there, and this is what I'm, I'm sharing with you. The Confederation of Chiefs, or Rangatira, as the seven point star represents, are there by right of Whakapapa. We have the rangatira in the lower house, we have the ariki in the upper house. And it's exactly as these two photographs up here represent. On your left is um, the ariki in the upper house of Māori Parliament. This photograph goes back to 1893, but before 1893 and before photographs, we had oil paintings, we had watercolours, but that's still a, a, a European introduced medium. Prior to that, it was always the mark of the moko that was the registration. On your right is the lower house made up of the rangatira line. So it's exactly that, our ariki, the kaitiaki of the upper house, our rangatira, the kaitiaki of the lower house. In the very bottom, hapu iwi, Although here is actually one of the most powerful whare of this whole structure, because without hapu, nothing moves. And that's exactly what has happened in these last 50 odd years when Kohuiro went into recess, is that this whole thing has just been growing cobwebs. It has been dormant and it has been sitting there until where's hapu utilise it. Now this whole structure is huge. I mean, it's everything that manages a nation. And although we see it on paper, and I've explained it to you in all its appropriate boxes, the most important thing that rises and comes from hapu is how did it really work? Because the most important thing to make this work is where did the putia come from? And if we just look and think back to what we know as state-owned enterprises, they're actually the fragments of what originally was set up by our tūpuna. And I'd like to go through some of those with you, um, just so that we understand where this went to. And it's not about going back over grievances, 
because we've grieved for far too long. It's about understanding the history of what used to be known and what we know as today. Is that better? Okay. One of these uh, ventures that our, were set up by our tūpuna was known as Takarari. It was also known as the Māori Messenger. It later became known as the Native Mail, and it was divided into two, being Native Telegraph and Native Post. While it's in red is when it's in ownership of Māori, when it's in blue is when it became absorbed into the colonial government. This time frame takes us up to about the late 1880s, only 40 odd years after Te Tiriti Waitangi. 1840 prior to 1840, European introduced diseases, the common cold, the measles, tuberculosis wiped out thousands of our tupuna. 1850s and 1860s, as New Zealand history recalls as Māori Wars, was actually our tupuna protecting their lands from being exploited and taken away by the British militia. 1870s was a very lucrative time, not only here in Aotearoa, but the rest of the world. 1880s was a world depression, and that's when all the promissory notes began that when the economy gets better in New Zealand, then the government or the colonial government will pay back to the Māori people what is owed. 1890s was the Boer War, 1920s the First World War, and 1940s the Second World War. By that time, there was nothing much left, and the Ariki had no choice to put, but to put Kohuido into recess. I just wanted to walk through that time frame because every venture I'm going to show you is around the same time. The Native Telegraph became known as New Zealand Telephone Exchange. There was another branch of it that was um, set up and it was known as New Zealand Radio Broadcasting. Telecommunications came from New Zealand Telephone Exchange and today we know that as telecom, mobile, radio telephone, satellite and beacons. From Radio New Zealand, uh, sorry, New Zealand Radio Broadcasting became known as Radio New Zealand and then much later down the line, TVNZ. The whakapapa and origins still go back to Te Kārere. The native post became known as New Zealand Post Office and then divided into New Zealand Post and Post Bank. Post Bank has been sold as a state-owned enterprise. New Zealand Post was threatened to be sold in 1986, but the Ariki reminded the government that the origins went back to Te Kārere, so they stopped that sale, but today, they're looking at franchising each New Zealand post. Radio New Zealand, after much controversy, sold as a state-owned enterprise. TVNZ, just been sold as a state-owned enterprise. Telecom, sold as a state-owned enterprise. Another venture our tūpuna set up was known as Native Couriers. And it was known, we had our own native shipping, we had our own native transport. It is proved that we had this flag that allowed us free access to every British port in the back of the British registered ships is actually all the names of our tūpuna, the names of the ships, the names of the ports that they were registered at, which proves that we definitely had our native shipping and they weren't just little ships, they were three and four master trading ships. Native transport became divided into two, being railways and New Zealand road services. Railways, one chain across, you may be aware, is still own, under ownership of the Māori nation. But it is still under lease, and the lease has never, ever been broken. However, all the rolling stock on top of the railways has been sold as a state-owned enterprise for around 400 million, including all the buildings, but the land underneath is still leased. Right throughout the North Island and the South Island, the lease still remains at $1 a year. <laughs> New Zealand road services became privatised, individualised, 
And then later on down the line, we had a New Zealand Air Corporation, which went through this whole process to be known as Air New Zealand and was sold off as a state-owned enterprise. <laughs> Native shipping, once there was no putia to maintain anymore, became absorbed into what was known as the Union Steamship Company. We know, we know that today as P&O Lines. The Whakapapa of the Awuru Bank, the Native Reserve Bank, set up in 1808 at Kōrarika. It operated in Auckland when Auckland became the capital. It operated in Ahuriri, Napier, when Napier became the capital for a short time. It also operated in a place that we know within Tainui on one of our major motorways, the Waikato River, at a place called Cambridge. But every New Zealand post office was an agent on behalf of the Awaroa Bank. In 1889, because of the many things that began to take place, it was agreed that the Bank of New Zealand, which is the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, absorb the accounts from the Awaroa Bank, but pay back to, to the Māori nation equity as in representation of population. It started back then, of course it never happened. In 1990, the Bank of New Zealand was sold as a state-owned enterprise. The Whakapapa of Māori owned land leased to the Crown really important because there were millions and millions and millions of acres of Māori-owned land leased to the Crown. The same land as what we see every month in Apānui, called Crown-owned land with Māori interest. It was agreed then that the government would pay to the Māori landowner 6% of the value of the land but the 94% would go into a land bank. And this is exactly where our land bank began. From there, it is all documented that the colonial government may use that land and use that 94% of the money for Māori health, Māori education, Māori welfare, and Māori housing. And that's exactly what was set up. Native hospitals, native schools, native housing, and timber mills, because it came under health, education, housing, and welfare. The timber mills became defunct once all our forests were uh, felled. There was nothing left. Native housing, Papakainga, became known as Māori housing. Then it became known as state housing. And then it was known as housing corporation. And that's been privatised off. Native hospitals and native schools still are still there, but they're actually being transferred into European title. Your major Rotorua Hospital here and all the major schools right throughout were originally native schools and native hospitals. From this land bank, there were huge ballots of land runs leased to buy to European. The uh, majority of the South Island was made up like that. Every hydro dam is built on the land from the land bank with the money from the 94%. Acquisition lands, which were taken for return servicemen lands and defence lands, taken from the land bank, and when the return servicemen lands were, were no more, they were actually gifted to the return servicemen for their lifetime. And when that return serviceman had passed on, then that land was to go back into the land bank to the original Māori landowner. We have second and third descendants from the return servicemen who are still on those lands, but are innocent because they didn't know what the deal was. And then we have local hapu protesting and occupying lands because they remember that they were ancestral lands. Defence lands were taken for defence and they weren't to be used anymore. They were to go back into the land bank. We have defence lands being used as raupatu settlement. And again, it's take from that original landowner and give to someone else. Forestry, every, right through, right through this country, we have huge tracts of forestry. Not far from here, you have the largest man-made forest in the world, or in the Southern Hemisphere. And those lands, were, uh, the forestry was actually 
taken from the land bank with the money from the 94%, and today we have multinational companies managing and controlling those lands, and again, we have hapu protesting and, op and occupying those lands because they remember those were ancestral lands. The whakapapa of native reserves. Native reserves came about by every legal purchase of land that the Crown did make. And they did make some legal purchases. 10% would be walked out by the hapu and kept aside as native reserves. Where these native reserves were used to be is where the native villages were, where the favourite hunting grounds were, where the favourite fishing grounds were. And then alongside that, under the New Zealand Settlement Act, were set up townships. Today, the fragments of these native reserves are what we know as parks and reserves, regional parks, and docklands. Department of Conservation. The Whakapapa of Wastelands, 1840 to Tiriti Waitangi. 1841, the first wasteland was passed and put in place. Wastelands was determined by any land that hapu iwi weren't living on were wastelands. But it was from these wastelands that our major resources, our forests, our minerals, our gold, were taken from what is known as wastelands. The same land is actually what is tossed between government and local government. And we have hapu jumping up in the middle trying to take back what belongs to them. The treaty contract to Tiriti Waitangi in 1840 as it was and the treaty partnership as it still stands today. That in 1840 there was absolutely no question that the Crown of England was forming a contract with the Māori nation as their own sovereign nation. It was already recognised, it was already recognised by the Crown of England that the Māori nation was its own sovereign nation. Kohuero Parliament, or Māori Parliament, was already operating as early as 1808. <coughs> New Zealand Parliament did not get into place put in place here in New Zealand until after the 1852 New Zealand Constitution Act. There was no governing body here in New Zealand because every non-Māori was actually governed by New South Wales. New Zealand government was put in place in 1859-1860 and it was put in place for non-Māori. It was already, already recognised and accepted in the 1852 New Zealand Constitution Act that Māori were already governing, managing their own affairs and that it's actually in there. The New Zealand Constitution Act, which is an imperial act protected by a letter of patent, means that no government can change that particular act. However, in 1987, there was an amendment to that act and it, if you look through it, you'll find there's absolutely nothing in there that is, that is Māori issue in there. It is only the part that proclaims to European or non-Māori that has been amended. It has not been touched. A general electorate was set up, and it was set up for a tribe that became a legal tribe in 1840 called Ngāti Wikitoria. Ngāti Wikitoria, the descendants of England, Scotland, Wales, or Ireland. And anyone else who came within New Zealand and was naturalised after five years became part of Ngāti Wikitoria. The manu that was gifted to Queen Victoria, the same as this manu here, is known as the manu of the Taiopuru. Within each of our hapu, within each of our iwi, we have a symbolic uh, manu bird because that has always been very, very important to, to us as Māori. The manu that was gifted to Queen Victoria at the time of the treaty was the kōtuku, the white heron. And if you look on government buildings today, you'll see a, a kōtuku, a heron, white heron. Queen Elizabeth II today is still acknowledged as the lone flight 
of the white heron. And so that has always been known, it is still documented that this bird, this manu, was gifted to Queen Victoria at that time. Now, if you think about how many of our New Zealanders who have migrated here from overseas since um, 1840, and it's 1999 today, you'll find that all those that actually make up Ngāti Wikitoria are a much, much larger um, population and majority than those who are represented as Māori electorate. In 1867, because of the many legislations that were being put in place in order to alienate our lands from us, it was important that our tūpuna saw there had to be some monitoring in the New Zealand government or New Zealand parliament. So in 1867, we had our first four Māori seats within New Zealand Parliament. It is 1999, and we've just got our sixth Māori seat. <laughs> so the seats aren't keeping up with the population. We have a right as Māori to be on the general electorate or the Māori electorate, because the Māori electorate was only set up not too long ago. We have many Māori on the general electorate, we have Māori on the Māori electorate, and we have Māori out there who just given up with the system and they won't register at all, and I don't blame them. However, we had to test this. We tested it all the way through to make sure, is this what our tūpuna really meant? Because I have only ever heard that our tūpuna were brilliant. And at the time that they were setting up in um, agreeing to a treaty, it didn't happen on the 6th of February 1840. It took six or seven years from this first contractual treaty way back in 1832. And so because Māori were on the general electorate as well as the Māori electorate, that partnership didn't quite seem right because it's meant to be an equal partnership. So my, I'd, like you to, I'd like to introduce you to my husband, who I always use as a guinea pig. Sorry, Rob. Just stand up here, Rob. My husband, Rob, and he's Ngāti Wikitoria. <laughs> what Robin did is he went and registered himself on the Māori electorate. He registered as Ngāti Wikitoria and his waka being Te Kōtuku. And... He was jumping up and down, down in Wellington, said you can't do that, because the orange book said you can't do that. However, they left him alone, and the next year he got a card asking if he'd like to transfer back to the general electorate, like most of us Māori who are registered on the Māori electorate. Now, the reason that we tested this is that it has been 1840, this partnership was like this. And over the years, this partnership has slowly been going like that, and it's climbing like that, and it's just not, it's not stopping. And so it was bringing it back to what really was fair and what our tūpuna really did mean by a treaty. It's about a partnership, and it's about a fairness, and it's about an equality. So we've gone through this... Um, Courted or with many Ngāti Wikitori associates and friends and relatives, and once they found out and realised just what it is that Māori are jumping up and down about, they also are registering themselves on the Māori electorate. It's just a, um, a history and uh, information that I needed to share with you. In 1947, this whare here, Kohuiro Parliament, went into recess. And if you can see, there's only been one way for the Māori nation to go. And it has been totally within um, an arena whereby um, policies have been written by people who have no idea what it is that the Māori nation needs are, which is why today in 1999, the Māori nation is actually classed as a third world nation living beside a first world nation within an affluent country. Something did not work and something didn't go well because the people who were looking after the policies for health, education, housing, welfare did not 
listen or hear what people were actually asking for. On the 28th of October 1997, this box here, Kohuiro Parliament, came out of recess. And the reason that it came out of recess is because I mentioned that the most powerful whare out of this whole structure was hapu. And this whole thing had to be picked up and reactivated by hapu. And so we went back exactly as we did with you right, right today in your whare, that the most important place that we needed to come right back to is the marae-based hapu, because that is exactly how our tūpuna set it up, that our whare is the parliament, and that our whare stand and actually sit on sovereign land, that the marae is the sovereign land, that Māori customary law is exactly what happens there, that European law cannot enter into the whare or the marae of our different whare tūpuna. And over the time, it has been very cleverly designed that we be taken away from something that is the most powerful authority for us as a Māori nation, and that is our hapu, our, our marae. During the 1950s, 1960s, the industry waved the carrot, we all went to the cities, we went to the towns, and we are now descendants of what we know as urban Māori. I'm an urban Māori, I live in Tamaki Makaurau, I don't live back on my grandfather's whenua, Maniapoto, and I don't live within Ngāti Power on my grandmother's whenua. I live in Auckland. And there are many, many of us that live in the cities because that is where we were taken to. The lands that were our tūpuna lands were leased out, and then it came under what was set in place as the 1955 Trust Board Act. This is how the structure used to be before Kohuiro went into recess, and it was one of the most democratic, um, fair structure that used to be. That each of these circles represent a hapu, that each of these symbols here represent the marae or, or whare or pā, depending on how large our hapu are. That if this marae-based hapu over here wished to form a joint venture with that one, it was entirely within their right to do that. The profits, the resources remained at hapu level. That if this hapu here they wished to form a joint venture with that one, because maybe their lands ran side by side, then it was entirely done at a hapu runana level, but the resources and the profits remained at hapu level. If the whole iwi wished to do something, then it was done at an iwi runana level, but everything remained right back down with hapu. In 1955, after Kohuiro went into recess, a very damaging act was put in place and it was called the 1955 Trust Board Act. What that did do is it cut everything from here down away. Everything was held up the top. The constitution is set up by uh, the Crown or the government. Um, the trustees are only accountable to the Minister of Māori Affairs. They do not have to listen to the people, which is why we're in the status of a third world nation today. And it is actually a government agent. What has happened, of course, is over many, many of the hapu who have been disenchanted with what is going on, it had been put through um, by many, but I, I, I let you know the way that we utilise um, the free carriage of Westminster and took it directly to the Crown, although Kohuiro had gone into recess, it means in recess, it's not shut. There was one whare that was left open and it was the Ariki uh, Ahu Piri o Ngā Kōhere. And we utilised the free carriage of Westminster and went through that way. And just uh, in a simple term, it was like this. We went from Hapu through this access that was still there to the Crown of England, who then informed New Zealand Parliament to put certain things back in place. Because the whole move towards phasing out the, news, uh, the 1955 Trust Board Act was not through the aroha of the MPs in there. In fact, they all jumped up and down. It was actually from a higher, a higher order that that came down. 
Now, last year, um, Tapuni Kokiri took uh, this matter out to Hapu Iwi and asked Hapu Iwi if they wished to amend the Act or phase the Act out altogether. And we all, we all put the submission through and said, Nā hapu katoa, um, phase the Act out, we don't want it, we want to go back to what our tūpuna originally had structured. And uh, we are aware that by the year 2000, which is only a few months away, the 1955 Trust Board Act is phased out and it is up to the hapu iwi then what they wish to do. So we've had many organisations being set up called runanga. And really what it was is a group of people over here and the Trust Board's moving over here calling themselves a runanga. But the same constitution that holds everything up the top. So the hapu that we have been associating with and sharing this kaupapa was about it's the perfect time for hapu to set back up their hapu runanga and keep the empowerment right back down with the people. And that's exactly what we have um, been doing over the last few years. I'd like to just take this part into the next arena because, um, yes please, um, it really brings us up to where we are at right today. And I needed to take us through that history so that we see that the authorities that were in place way back then are still there for us to utilize as a Māori nation. I mentioned how everything is still in its full entirety within Te Whare Te Kārere and in the House of St. James in England. So this map here is exactly what, how it was in 1947 when Kohuiro went into recess. This is actually um, outlines the boundaries of the seven main tribal areas. And if you can see, um, I'll, I'll point to it anyway, that these purple lines here are actually where the, the boundaries of uh, the seven main tribal areas, and I'll go through those with you. And um, this area up here is known as the main tribal area of Ngāpuhi. And while we're up here, I'd just like to say that every hapu, every iwi is no greater than any other. Because when we get down around here somewhere, um, if you're from certain other main tribal areas, you might raise your eyebrows. So I just want to go through this because this is history. This is how it went into recesses, and this is exactly how we need to bring it out of recess. <laughs> The main tribal area of Napuhi um, is that area there. This area here is known as the main tribal area of Ngāti Whātua. This area here is known as the main tribal area of Tainui. And this area here is known as the main tribal area of Te Arua. This whole area here is known as the main tribal area of Kahununu. And that's what I mean. <laughs> Kahunu is no greater than Tuhoi or Tatano Apanui or Whakatohi or <laughs> Wairarapa. It is exactly how it was to define the seven main tribal areas. This main tribal area, right, all this area here is known as the main tribal area of Te Ateawa, which includes the Chatham Island, Moriori. And this area here is known as the main tribal area of Waitaha Katimamui. I just, I just hear of he actually, um, at that time, Naitahu was actually up in here. Um, because it was important to look at reactivating what was in place by sticking totally with Māori customary law, because by doing that, we could in no way be interfered with by European law. And that is why it was so important to bring that whole basis back to marae-based hapu, because on that sovereign land, no European law can enter into there, and that is the mandate that our tūpuna had originally set up. From the 28th of October 1997, when I mentioned Kohuiro came out of recess, 
It didn't mean to say that we suddenly had all these authorities and everything was in place. We had a lot of mahi that had to be done. We had to actually find one hapu from each of these seven main tribal areas to actually step outside the square and stand over here. And the reason I say that is because every marae is under an incorporated society under the Tuturu Whenua Act, which is actually under a government agent. And we had that handed over in 1947. So in order to come right back to sovereign Māori law, Māori customary law, we had to step outside of the government agent, come over here and set up another body, a legal body, um, in order for those hapu to stand on their own mana as a sovereign body to carry out Māori customary law. Now that body that was set up, a legal entity, was very important because from the incorporated society, which actually disempowers hapu, it actually disempowers hapu and allows another body to manage your resources and everything for you. It was to set up a body that was going to have the empowerment uh, for hapu to carry out their commercial business, look after their own resources, and have vested back in them from this other government agent their resources. So what was set up was a charitable trust. The charitable trust being that although we're talking Māori customary law here, it was important to equip the hapu with a legal body because all resources were still out there. Now with that charitable trust, it was important that the hapu set up their runanga too. So we, got, we came down and we said, okay, we'll go with one. So within this area here of Ngāpui, there was a hapu based up here at Pohotiare, uh, known as, um, oh sorry, based up here at Te Hapua, known as Pohotiare. They had set themselves up outside of, of the system and uh, set up their hapu runanga, which opened it up for all the hapu within this area, within Ngāpui. Within Ngāti Whātua, we had a hapu set themselves up called Ngā Uri o Hau Moe Wārangi, who were based up here in Kaipura, and they set up their runanga and set up their uh, legal entity outside of, of the um, incorporated society. They opened it all up for every hapu within Ngāti Whātua. Within Tainui, we have we actually have two in there, but it's only because they got it together at the same time. So we have we have Nati Fafakia, who's sitting over here, uh, of Waikato. We have Nati Wairere of Waikato. Within Tiarua, this whole area here, we managed to get a um, little hapu base right down here at Kakahi called Nati Mananui or Tufareto. And uh, they opened it up for the whole of Tiarua. Within this whole area here, which is a large area, we managed to get a little a hapu who live in the bush in Waimana. Naitamatuhira or Tuhoi. And by that stand, by doing that, it opened up for the whole of all these areas here. Within this whole area of Te Atiawa, um, a little hapu based here called uh, Ruka Ruka Ki Te Atiawa is actually based on the Hefi track. They don't even have a whare, they have a stone. But they did exactly according to go back and um, empower themselves as a runanga. And within this whole area here, we have a hapu called Kurawaka Ki Waikaha, based here in Christchurch. Now through that, that took over a year, and that was achieved by the 7th of November, 1998. And by utilising again the free carriage of Westminster going through the upper house, it took it directly to the Crown of England, whereby the, the submission really said, thank you for looking after our, our, um, our business, we're now looking after it ourselves. And the proof is that we've actually stepped outside a government agent and we are an autonomous body. Now what that also did is it, it was a dual process. Not only did it reactivate 
kohuiro um, itself, parliament, but it, and, and reactivated the hapu autonomy. It also reactivated the electoral areas that have been sitting dormant all this time within Kohuiro. They're actually electoral areas and with electoral seats that have been there all this time, and I'd like to just go through those with you, because the hapu registration actually became instigated the electoral role um, for Kohuiro Parliament. Now within Napui, there is only one electoral area there, and in each of the electoral areas, there are four seats. There are two seats for Māori, there are two seats for Ngāti Wikitoria. And that is exactly how our Tupane had set it up. After 1840 to Tiriti Waitangi, it was opened up for that other legal tribe. So within Ngāpui, there are four seats there. Within Ngāti Whātua, there is one electoral area. There are four seats there. Within Tainui, it was actually divided into two. This is known as Hauraki Tainui, and this is known as Maniapoto Tainui. There are four seats in Hauraki Tainui, and there are four seats in Maniapoto Tainui. Within Te Arawa, there is one electoral area, so there are four seats in here. And within this whole area of um, the whole coast, it is actually divided into four. And in each of these four, there's four seats here in Matatua. There are four seats here in uh, Kiwairua. There are four seats here in Hiritanga. And there are four seats here in Wairarapa. Within this whole area here, it was actually divided through here. There are four seats there and four seats there. And within this whole area, there is four seats there. There are actually 48 compulsory electoral seats that have been sitting dormant within Kohuiro, and through the hapu that took it through on the 7th of November 1998, it instigated the electoral roll, uh, which opened up for every hapu right throughout the land and every New Zealander, um, the electoral areas within Kohuiro Parliament. I'd like to um, just go through a time frame that we've um, been working with, and I know that although many here have never ever heard of Kohuiro, we've really tried to get this corridor out, but um, we haven't been too too uh, successful. But uh, as of last week, um, it was wonderful because um, Te Karere covered two of our hui, and it's now getting out, and it's good to see um, someone here today as well. So we have been trying for a long time to get this out to the people, and we have been boycotted. From the 7th of November 1998, it took it through to another frame, a time frame, which is right up to the 26th of June 1999. What that period did is that it allowed um, an appeal from the Crown of England it allowed for a period of reappeal, and all that passed, which meant that by the 26th of June 1999, it was totally legal and had gone through. There was a hui in uh, Auckland where that date was carried out and a court was held, uh, which activated Kohuiro and which activated the electoral seats and the electoral areas within the whole of the seven main tribal areas. A warrant was then passed on the 28th of June calling on the seven main tribal areas to put forward their nominations for candidates. That period took it through to the 9th of August, 1999. We now are into the 4th of September. We were wanting at least the 48 compulsory seats filled. And where there were areas and time where we had to check through the registrations that were actually open since November 1998. And we saw that there were different areas that were lacking um, in, in knowledge of knowing about this. So we'd just been out on Hikoi um, targeting those areas that needed, needed some boost to understand that this was already in process. On the 10th of August, a second warrant was passed whereby the elect elections and the campaigning began. 
So by the 9th of August, when I said that we needed 48, we've actually got 69 candidates that came forward and registered before the 9th of August. So it is now in that period right now of campaigning. The elections is actually on the 18th of December, 1999. The uh, publication of that will be on the 26th of January, the year 2000. And by, by March 2000, Kohiro Parliament needs to be up, filled with all members of Parliament to be running side by side with New Zealand Parliament. Because we had to take it through that legal avenue, each time we did, we had response from Government House. So what I'm saying, this is not treason. It is totally what was history, it was in place, it used to operate, and it is there for us to pick up. It is history, it is authority, because it was in place before 1840. On the, um, after the 26th of June, um, sorry, where are we? No, after the 7th of November, 1998, the submission went directly through to the Crown of England. Copies were sent to the Governor-General here in New Zealand, as well as to the Prime Minister. So they have copies of all those hapu. They have all their names there, so they know who's who. They, <laughs> they, um, they are totally aware of what has been happening. On the 27th of January, 1999, we got a letter back from the Government House um, saying that the Governor-General has asked me to acknowledge the receipt of a copy of your submission to reactivate the Kohuiro Māori Parliament addressed to the Executive Council of Te Runanga Kohuiro. After the 26th of June, 1999, and the second submission went through, whereby the whole structures were set in place by the hapu, by the runanga that were going to be set up in the seven main tribal areas. Another, another letter came back from Government House saying, I am writing to acknowledge the receipt of your submission to Te Whare Ahupiri or Ngā Kōhere. It would be helpful to know whom you have sent this submission since this would determine how Government House should deal with it. <laughs> So since that time, we have informed the Ariki because everything has been held in the Kaitiaki, um, who have informed Government House that everything has now been passed over to the people. It is up to the people to structure exactly how and everything is to be in place before 1840, uh, which is recognised by and put in place there within the 1852 New Zealand Constitution Act. <clears throat> 